Well, hey there, Canadian Wealth Secret Seekers. Today, we are going to have an episode where we dig into some details around the new capital gains inclusion rates that are uh, actually in effect. And then supposedly this fall, um, they will actually be approved to go in. So there's still a vote to be had. But however, the date was June 25th, 2024, when... Mm -hmm. The inclusion rate for personal capital gains over $250,000 realized in a year or corporate capital gains are going to be going from 50% to two thirds or about 67%. But we're here today to unpack that a little bit more, maybe um, you know, sort of correct some misconceptions out there sure. around the capital tax rules, both the original rule or the the rule before June 25th, and now what we're dealing with now. But also, more importantly, it's like I get so many people, um, high net worth, corporate owner or uh, incorporated business owners, all of these people are reaching out to me now, and they were reaching out ahead of that June 25th date, and they were throwing their arms up saying like, this is horrible. Like this is how can we pay more tax? And they're all worried. And I tell most of them that, you know what, um, this is actually not your biggest tax problem. So we're going to unpack that a little bit more later, but let's dig in here. John, you were just recently chatting with someone who mm -hmm. had a very common misconception. Let's talk about the old rule or the under $250,000 capital gain rule that will still be in place for personal right. realized capital gains. What is that common misconception? And let's make sure everybody's clear on it before we dig into the weeds here and talk about the reality of the situation. Yeah, I think it was at a Canada Day party this year. And it was just, I think we were just chatting about you know, and making all investments. the things you were thankful for, you know, yeah, all the yeah. recent news uh, about taxes. <laughs> right. Right. It's like a week later. Right. And it's like, you know, the mis the misconception or, or, or this person, you know, I just, I think we just, we went down a rabbit hole and we started talking about, you know, the capital gains tax and like, yeah, you know, like I'm going to lose, you know, two thirds of my, of my money in, in terms of this capital gains tax. If, if we, if this changes, and, and I was like, well, tell me, tell me more about what you think that, you know, looks like. And I think the misconception is that, is that let's say I have an investment and I go to, let's say it's a, you know, a real estate property and I go to sell that real estate property. There's a gain there. So I think most people get the gain part, right? It's like, okay, let's say I have a hundred thousand dollar gain. I think what people are thinking is that on the old rule. And, and, and it applies to the new rule, but let's say, let's say I have a gain of a hundred thousand dollars and the old would be like, I'm going to have, I'm going to be taxed at 50%, <laughs> which I think they think is that I'm going to lose 50% of the right. gain. Like 50% of the gain is taxed, like, which is true. That statement I just said is true, but they think it is 50% is gone. It's like going that's the away. actual tax that I have to pay. I have to right. give up 50%. Of the of that because it sounds like when you hear a tax rate, you know you think okay, well fifty percent is it's taxed at fifty percent, which means I'm going to lose fifty percent of that gain. Instead of saying fifty percent is actually tax free, right? And then the other fifty percent isn't gone. The other fifty percent is taxed at whatever your rate is. You know wherever right. you la land on your on your on your on your income, you know, like that. And so that might be, let's say it's 30%. So you're, you're only going to pay 30% tax on the 50%. So it's $50,000 is taxable. And then I'm going to pay whatever, like, it's almost like, think of it as like, I got $50,000 in extra income this year. And now I'm going to pay the tax on that new amount. Right. Right. So and, what I'm instead of going, say... lose it, lose it all. Yeah, like imagine if you're taking like a hundred thousand dollars personally, okay? So this is a hundred thousand dollars that you've already paid personal taxes on, right? So like it was more than a hundred. The government took as much as they would take when you were in that particular tax year. You took it and you grew it to two hundred thousand dollars. So basically, Kyle's you're drawing. Get, by the way, if you're yeah, if I've you're got my little document camera up here. It's really really. Go, go over to YouTube right now and have a look. Anybody, anybody who's been on calls with me, they, they deal with the document, random document camera, you know, being thrown up here on the screen. So you sell this asset, you bought it for a hundred thousand, you sold it for 200,000. 
That means that original hundred, you're not going to get taxed again on that. That just go back into your bank account. You already paid, yeah, you paid income that. tax on that, right? At whatever bracket you were at. If you did it over a number of years where you're in a low bracket, then you paid not a lot of tax on it. If you did it over one year where you were in the highest tax bracket, then you paid a lot of tax on it. That part doesn't really apply here. But what does apply is that you've got this $100,000 gain. And what I heard you just say, which is the correct mentality, is that if... In this case, the capital gains 100,000. So if you own this personally, even with the new rules, you are still only going to include half of that income into your tax, taxable income, and the other half mm -hmm. is tax-free. So that's right. like, nobody ever talks about the part that's tax-free, right? They just talk about how horrible it is. And in reality, this is not that bad. Like that's not tax a free. Huge... Sounds pretty good. It's like oh, I made a hundred thousand dollars, and I don't have to pay tax on it over ha on half of it. Right. Exactly. And that taxable amount, this little part here, this fifty thousand dollars, is going to get tapped or tagged onto your income for that given year. Right. So Correct. if I earned you know, $250,000 already, I now have earned 300,000 that year. And that 50% is going, to, or that 50,000 is going to get taxed at a very high tax bracket, right? I'm going to pay a lot of taxes on the 50,000 part of the gain. The other 50 tax-free in your bank account. Now, of course, if you claimed no income that year, right? So maybe you're a retiree sure. and you don't have, you know, an, a, a riff where you have to take money out or you don't have a pension where you have to take an income. Maybe you took no income that year from any of your investment accounts, your RSP, your tax-free savings. That would be tax-free, of course, but your RSP would not. You would just be claiming a $50,000 income in that given year. So when you really think about it, you can look at it as you're going to get taxed on you know, 50% of the gain gets taxed, or you can think of it the other way is that that hundred thousand, you're going to pay half of the tax bracket you're in on the full hundred. Whoa. I just did our old math teaching move right there, John. It's like the doubling and having strategy, right? It's like, if I pay tax at my current bracket on half the amount, that's the same thing as paying half the taxes on the whole amount. So however you want to do it, the maximum amount you're going to pay personally on that portion is going to be, or on the full capital gains, going to be about 26-ish percent if you're in Ontario right. on the full 100. Or you can say on 50,000, you're paying the 54-ish percent tax rate in the highest bracket. But for everybody else, it's going to be a lower tax bracket. So it's actually not that bad. Although right. a lot of people already said, you already took money from me in order to make this investment. So you shouldn't tax the upside either. I agree with you, but that's just not the case. But at least, you know, you're not losing half of the return or nowadays you're not losing 67% of the upside. If the capital gain was $250,000 right. or more. Yeah. So the same same applies there. Like there's no change in your thinking when the number just changes. So you just have to now apply, okay, um, it's 67% um, inclusion instead of 50%. So Kyle, what's the, you know, I think I think we've made it clear like where the where the misconception is, but so what's the real problem? Like you said, you're talking with people and I think, you know, which is also surprising that, you know, you're talking with business owners, high net worth individuals, people who have lots of retained earnings and trying to strategize the uh, best best practices around keeping more of their hard earned you know earnings inside their you know inside their company and not you know pass it over to the tax. So you do this on a regular basis. So mm -hmm. what and, and that was the surprising part is that you've got business owners who are like that's the way they think and you're helping them kind of first correct there. But then you're saying that's not the real issue. Like the like that's 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 not that bad to, to pay these these amounts on the game. We just talked about that. But what's the real issue then? Well, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to break it down into two pieces. We're going to talk personally. So those who have assets outside of a corporation, you might still have a corporation, but we're talking mm -hmm. specifically about personally owned assets, your tax-free savings, your RSP, your unregistered accounts, your home, your, all of these things are, are personal assets that you own. For those people, when we don't consider the actual, um, you know, the actual corporation, I'm going to talk about the real tax problem for many people is the RRSP. A lot of people are still buying 
things that have capital gains associated with them inside of their RSP. So I've redrawn this on this little document camera here. And you see that, yes, we have 100,000 that's gone into the RSP. You okay. got your tax back on that 100,000. Now that's the part that people like. But here's the thing that the vast majority of Canadians do. Once they get that tax-free refund, they very rarely take the refund and invest that amount as well. Right. That part you should be doing if you're not already. You shouldn't be taking it and then using it for lifestyle unless you needed that for lifestyle. And the only way to fund your RSP was to, you know, was to do it in that manner. But here's the problem that happens later. Let's say you bought the same stock, $100,000 of stock, or maybe it was an index fund and there was a capital gain where it doubled over time. We went sure. from 100,000. This is scalable, by the way. If it's 200,000, we can apply it to whatever the gain is on that, a million, doesn't matter. But let's look at this one. We say, okay, we went from 100,000 in the RSP. It now became 200,000. The problem is that the entire 200,000 is going to be taxed on the way out. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have to take it all out at the same time, which is what we would encourage people to do is slowly take it out, slowly melt it down so that you, you know, kind of govern how much taxes or what tax bracket you're in when you slowly right. melt it down. But the reality is, is that for this particular gain, if we look at an individual year, you get no capital gain exemption here. What I mean by this is that means none of that amount that you earned inside of there is tax free. You also still have to pay tax on the original 100,000 you put in. So you have $200,000 that you need to pay tax on. And if we think about this and say 200, let's say you pulled all 200 out in any given year, that is $200,000 of income, not paying 50% inclusion rate or even the 67 in this case, that wouldn't be over 250. So you wouldn't apply the 67 anyway, if it wasn't in an RSP, but here you are paying 100% inclusion right? for that capital gain, which is a massive, um, I would say, you know, nuance to what's going on in the background. Everyone just says, wow, it's, you know, it's tax free. It's not tax free. It's tax deferred and tax deferred is better than not deferring tax, but you lose your capital gain exemption. So basically what you're doing is you're trading some of the benefit yeah. and you have to be really, I, I suppose, you have to be thinking about this when you're funding your RSP. Now, if there's only 200,000 total in an RSP, this is not a real concern, but what happens is people's RSPs become much greater in value, right? A million, two million, sometimes they get up into 5 million, whatever it is, right? Depending on how long they've been funding for and how much they've been funding for, these RSP accounts can get quite large and then people don't start taking money out early enough. Hmm. So when they don't start taking money out early enough, you know, what do we, what do, we do? Because, and we've talked about... Uh, I guess, I guess we've talked about this on other, other episodes, but I mean, like, you know, you, the mindset is that I'm going to be in a lower tax bracket, but we, we argue here on this podcast. And if you're listening to this podcast, you're hoping that's actually not the case, right. Like you're building your business, you're making more income. And it's like, how you want to get to a place where like, you don't have to, you know, worry about money anymore. And that might mean you have a lot. And especially if you're RSP, you're going to be like, if I'm going to melt this down, that's a lot of money that I have mm -hmm. to now like pull out of there. Like I get the idea that I'm, I'm de tax deferring this. You got to pay tax somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, we're not going to be able to get around this. You either pay the tax before it goes into the pot, which is like, okay, well it goes into the say unregistered accounts. I pay tax now and I get some gains. I got to pay the capital gains tax on, on the money that comes out of there. Or I put it stuff, my RSPs I, and I, have to pay tax when that money comes out later on, but I don't pay tax on it now. So it's like, right. we, we all know that we're going to have to pay tax somewhere. Yeah. So it's like, what do I do in the case? Like you just presented the real problem of like, you've got 200,000 that's now taxable in, you know, in your RSP and we're going to melt it down. Is that, is that basically your, your suggestion? What else can yeah. you do? 
Yeah. And, and by all means, it's like, Hey, listen, RSPs there, it's, it's better to pay less tax now, even though I have to pay tax later, but you have to be aware of what's actually going on. So all I say to people is regardless of where you are in that journey, you've got to do the math. Like you got to do the thinking. And sometimes that means working with a thought partner, right? Working with someone, an advisor you trust. If you're working with the big bank person, they're going to say, don't melt it down because they lose money when you do that. Right. I mean, that right. makes sense. Like they're the assets under management. There's a, there's a commission that's associated with it. Right. The mm -hmm. reality is, is you just got to do the math to figure out what's the best move based on all of these buckets. So with the RSP, I just want to make sure that people are aware that you know, your capital gains inclusion rate, like this is a non-issue for people who don't have, say, unregistered accounts that have uh, growth assets in them, growth, you know, stocks that are going to have capital gains. Um, it is a problem for people who own real estate, right? Personally, if you go and sell a building and, and it's a big capital gain after a long period of time, this is a, pr a problem for you. But again, it would be better to pay the capital gain even at the new rate over 250,000 then say to have that building locked up in an RSP where you're going to pay on 100% of that gain right so there's all kinds of different factors we have to think about but i want to shift here just yeah, to uh, talk to our business owners those who are incorporated especially those who are uh, have an operating company so active income is being earned you're paying a low corporate tax rate on the active income um there's still some challenges for those earning passive income too um, but with the active income, especially people are now saying, oh man, my corporation, they've been saving the retained earnings inside of their corporation and then reinvesting it into assets. We do that all the time. You and sure. I, John, you know, you, yeah. myself, Matt, we do it all the time, but here's the bigger problem because even though the capital gain is going to be higher, when you actually look at going from 50% inclusion to 67% inclusion, you're talking about paying about eight to 9% more in taxes on the capital gain, which okay. is like, I don't want to do it. I don't like it. I don't want to, but it's not like you're paying 16 or 17% more. Like you're paying, you know, 67 is 17% more than 50, right? Because that's just the inclusion rate. So when it all comes out in the wash, you're not actually paying a significant amount more where you're going to pay a significant amount more is on those retained earnings that you already took from your corporation already paid probably a low amount of tax, 12.2% here in Ontario, or if it's over 500,000 per year, that amount is 26.5%, still lower than doing that personally. That's a good deal. The problem is, is that all of that money, all of the retained earnings are earmarked. So as you build more and more retained earnings, I'm going to use an example of 1 million here for a second inside our company, because this happens all the time with companies. They go, okay, got this million dollars retained. And then they put it into things like buildings. It might even be the building that you're using for your operating company, or it might be a real estate building, or it might be growth stocks. It could be the same growth stocks or growth in index funds and equity index funds that you were buying in your RSP. That might go, and I'm going to use double because it's easy. We're going to go up to 2 million. Uh, sorry, that's a total of 2 million. So I've got an extra $1 million capital gain. Sure, you're going to pay corporate capital gains tax on the two thirds. The one third is going to be tax free. That's going to go to the capital dividend account, which is a nice little account that allows you as a shareholder to take tax free dividends as you sell or crystallize gains inside the corporation. Fantastic. So I have tax here on the capital gains, but again, it's still going to work much like it does at the personal level. Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. government tries to put you in, we'll call it the highest tax bracket because they know that in the corporation, the reason you didn't pull it out was because it would push you too high up in the, in the, in the brackets. And therefore they assume that you should be paying about the same capital gains on your, um, your income or sorry, pay the same amount of income tax on those capital gains that are included as you would if you were in the highest personal tax bracket. So it's a bit of a wash there, especially if it's a big gain personal or corporate. Where your real issue is, is this retained earnings has not yet been taxed at the personal level. So Still while there. you have basically, you know, $667,000 that has to pay a cap gain tax, that's fine, but that tax rate's going to be lower than 
the gain, the actual income tax you have to pay when you personally pull that $1 million of retained earnings out. And this is the real tax problem for our business owner friends. And this is something that took you and I almost a decade to figure out with our own businesses that that money is going to get chopped almost in half if we took it all out and paid ourselves personally that money. So what do we do first? We stuff policies and we use permanent life insurance in order to help us. And that creates not only a windfall through the capital dividend account tax-free to shareholders after we go, it also gives us a massive amount of leverageability inside the corporation, as well as when we use compliance structures outside of your corporate structure to yourself personally as you build up these policies. So there are two major tax concerns that are greater than the actual inclusion rate that right. people are all worried about right now that I want to make sure that people out there, the Canadian Wealth Seeker audience, whether it's personal or corporate for you, that these are on your radar because here's the sad reality. Both of those things are secret sauces. The RSP doing a cap gain on 100% of the gain on the way out, as well as the retained earnings being taxed on the way out. These are two things that are often missed. They're often invisible. And it's only when you go to take them out that you start to recognize what's really happening. You've been playing the game for years and sometimes decades. And then you finally go to pull something and you realize that you're in a tax pinch and you didn't have the proper recommendations, perspectives, or advice from those who you thought had your best interest in mind, which I'm sure they do, but they might not even be aware of some of these nuances. If you're in that situation, right? Like if your RSP is in that, you know, it's it's grown and you're now going, oh crap, I've got to figure out how to get this money out of here. Reach out to us because we've just, you know, we just met with a client and, and structured through a policy, uh, through, you know, personal, uh, um, whole life dividend paying whole life policies to kind of melt that down, but also transition that, you know, that pot of money that would have been fully taxable because we had to like pull so much out, but because of the age of this client, um, you know, transition, transition that into the family estate so that it's not all going to the government or half of it's going to be going to the government. It's, 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 it's more of it will stay within the family than, than prior before, which is the same kind of strategy we're doing in the corporation side of things too. So if you're in either of those situations, you've got high, you know, corporate retained earnings and are going, oh, am I going to get that out of there? We've got strategies to help you uh, do that. If you've got, you know, on the RRSP side, we've got strategies there. That's that's what we do. And so reach out to us over at uh, uh, CanadianWealthSecrets.com forward slash discovery. And uh, we will uh, look at your, you know, situation and, and provide you some next steps.